or another area. I remember, good grief, I remember when I was in high school, I remember reading the textbooks I was being given in high school, and I remember thinking, there is something rotten in here. There is something that is just not right. And in particular, I remember the way big business was, was uh, treated. Now, you can't make any blanket statements about big business, because sometimes businessmen are wicked and should be behind bars. I mean, there's no question about that. They're just, a, they have all the same moral foibles the rest of us have. But at the same time, you also can't go to the other extreme and say, all businessmen are evil. They're all evil. All they do all day is exploit people. And, and uh, because of big business, if, if big business had their way, we'd all be crawling around eating dirt you know, working 80-hour weeks for a cent, a, a cent an hour. Uh, you know, that's the view that you get, that I got in high school, was that, man, if they had their way, that would be our fate. And thankfully, the, the lesson goes, the government stepped in and protected us from these wicked businessmen because the government is made up of wonderful people who have nothing but the best intentions, who just want to rescue us from all the wicked people. That is the view you get. It's in every textbook. There ain't no textbook, oh, I have to be careful. There isn't a textbook <laughs> out there that teaches you anything different. You get the same old the businessmen were wicked. Well, what I've tried to suggest um, in my book and in some of my other work is that, in fact, if it weren't for big business in the 19th century, which is the time when supposedly everybody was being exploited by the businessmen and all that, people would have been living much, much more miserable lives than they actually were living. Because, for instance, if you think of the guy who has been most demonized of all, the guy who they may as well draw horns on his head in the textbook, would be John D. Rockefeller, the great oil giant who was involved in refining oil. Now, it's important to remember, by the way, that you know, oil, you pump it from, from the ground, and then you refine it, and then you use it. Well, initially, people didn't know you could really use this black stuff coming up from the ground. It was just a big nuisance. If you were a farmer and you had oil uh, underneath your property and it would seep up from time to time, it was just a big nuisance. Well, then people realized that it could be refined into kerosene, which you could use to light your home. Well, now suddenly that black stuff is very worthwhile. So if you've ever seen, I don't know if anybody, any of the young people have ever seen the Beverly Hillbillies. But the, the, the show starts with a guy who all of a sudden, hey, there's oil on his, on his property, and he's not sad about that at all. Means he's going to be an instant millionaire and he's going to go move out to Beverly, you know, Beverly Hills, okay? Well, ultimately that's what happens, that people figured out this black stuff that seems like it's just annoying has a very important use, and in the mid-19th century it was discovered you can actually pump it up from the ground. You don't have to wait for it to just bubble to the surface and then try to scoop it up. You can pump it from the ground. Well, this changes uh, the landscape because now you can make this into kerosene, and instead of having to light your home using whale oil as an illuminant, you can use kerosene. Whale oil costs like $500 zillion an ounce. That's an approximation. It's not an exact <laughs> statistic. But it's extremely expensive. Most people can't afford whale oil. Whales aren't that happy that people are using whale oil either. But if you don't have to use whale oil anymore because you've got cheap black stuff coming out of the ground, that's an advance. And so John D. Rockefeller got involved in, in uh, the refining of oil. You take the crude oil from the ground, you refine it, and make it into kerosene. Well, the interesting thing about Rockefeller is sort of twofold. First, when Rockefeller first got started in this, kerosene was a dollar a gallon. By the time Rockefeller was done, it was 10 cents a gallon. Now imagine something. In our day, nothing really other than computers seems to go down in price. Imagine something going down by that many percentage points in price, and something that's so essential. You don't have to go to bed early anymore because you can't afford the whale oil to light your home. You can actually stay up late at night. Great, wonderful. I'm sure parents are thrilled at that. My kids can stay up even later than before. Great. But that is an advance in people's lives. Okay? They, they, have, they have a much higher standard of living as a result of this. They can get these things for much uh, cheaper. Secondly is that Rockefeller was a stickler for efficiency. He hated wasting things or throwing things away. Okay? Now, I know we all know people who just don't throw anything away, and that's not very efficient at all. They're just things pile up, old magazines or whatever. But what I mean is that when, when Rockefeller would refine the crude oil, he had all this guck left over. He's, here's his kerosene, here's the guck. And he says, I got like piles of guck over here. I mean, I'm just, and I'm just throwing it away. Isn't there anything I can do with guck? That's his first instinct is, I got the guck. I don't want to just throw it away. There's got to be some use. Somebody maybe needs some guck. Well, then he, he is able to develop 300 separate products out of guck that comes from crude oil. 
Now that's amazing, all right? I mean, this is not some guy to be despised and hated and draw horns on his head. I mean, we should reward that guy. I mean, yeah, he, be he became rich. Well, he should. If he can figure out 300 things to do with guck, I'll give him a couple of bucks, too. So this is an important advance. But instead, what do you read in the textbooks? Oh, he's vicious and terrible. And But what you don't hear about is, well, did oil get cheaper or did it get more expensive? It got much cheaper. Now, it's true that the Rockefeller Foundation has done a lot of rotten things. That's a separate matter. The point is that as an entrepreneur, Rockefeller was a, was, did great work for the average person. Or then you have Andrew Carnegie. He was involved in steel production. Every other thing in a modern economy is either made out of steel or requires steel in order to make it. So if you can cut the price of steel, you can make everything in the whole economy cheaper. You can make everybody better off. The government can make you better off by robbing your neighbor and giving you the money. But that doesn't make your neighbor better off. But if I can make everything you and your neighbor buy cheaper, that helps everybody. Carnegie was able to do that. He was so efficient that in his homestead plant in Pennsylvania, with 4,000 men, he could produce three times the steel they were producing at the greatest European uh, uh, factory uh, with 15,000 men. I mean, he's super efficient, such that thanks largely to Carnegie's efforts, the price of steel rails over the course of about a quarter century declined about 90%, again, almost like the reduction in the price of kerosene. An amazing advance. So that means not only is steel cheaper, but now everything that requires steel is cheaper. Now, do we see in the textbooks people saying, wow, that's wonderful that Carnegie did this. No, Carnegie's terrible and greedy and wicked and evil. Well, okay, maybe you feel that way, but that's not a very useful historical statement. I mean, what did the guy do? Why don't you tell me that? You don't typically get that in the books. Here's what you do get. Okay, typically you get this. You get this argument that big business, and here's your, here's your term for the day. Big business, we are told, engages in something called predatory pricing. Ooh, ooh, what does that mean? Well, that means that supposedly big business has the power to, let's say, let's say it's me and uh, Dick Clark's here in the room. We have a guy here named Dick Clark. Okay, I, I'll leave all the jokes, American Bandstand jokes out of this. It's not fair, and the young students don't even know what I'm talking about anyway. <laughs> fair enough. But suppose I'm competing with Dick Clark. The idea is that if I'm a, a gigantic business, I can charge such low prices that my smaller competitor, Dick Clark, and Dick Clark's like three feet taller than I am, my smaller competitor, Dick Clark, can't possibly match my prices. So I drive him out of business. The idea of predatory pricing is that I price my goods so low Nobody else can price them that low. They all go out of business. Everybody buys from me. But then, when all my competitors are out of business, then I jack the prices back up, because where are people going to go? OK, so it's sort of the principle of why it is if you go to the movies. I don't know why these days you would, but let's say you go to the movies. You notice that the small drink is like eight seventy-five. Like, why is that? Well, pretty much because you, where else are you going to go? You can't smuggle drinks into the theater. And I, you don't have to tell me stories about I smuggled a beer in. <laughs> Yes, I know you can do it, but you're not allowed to do it. The point is there's nowhere else for you to go. Well, that's the idea of predatory pricing, that the big business drives all the competitors out, raises the prices, there's nowhere else for you to go, got to buy from him, and then he makes all these great profits. Now, a lot of us sort of think, well, you know, that, that, that is what happens. Big business can do that, drives all its competitors out, and then raises price. The problem is you almost cannot find any examples of this. This is, the, this is one of the problems with the theory, is there don't seem to be any actual real-life examples. We've seen examples of businesses who lower their prices, but then we, but we don't really see examples of them then raising their prices back up. If Walmart tried to raise their prices back up, everybody would just go to Target, or they'd go to Kmart, or they'd order from Amazon. It's, it's, it's too difficult to, to do this. And even if you do manage to drive all your competitors out, new ones will pop up. If you start raising your prices again, new ones will pop up. So economists these days no longer believe in this. The general public believes in it because that's what we're told all the time. Big business wickedly drives everybody out of business by charging low prices. But economists really don't think that happens. And there's plenty of evidence to show that. And I want to give you a sort of cutesy little story to show what happens when you try this practice of uh, charging really, really low prices to drive out your competitors, and then you get to raise your prices back up again. One of my favorite stories from American business history, which I do include in, in the book, involves Herbert Dow. The name may ring a bell. He, runs the, he ran the Dow Chemical Company. He's dead now. He would be like 187 today or something. 
but he founded Dow Chemical around the turn of the century, into the 20th century. And he's a great chemical genius, and he was a really, really hard worker. I mean, really hard worker. He would work 18 hours a day and then sleep at his chemical factory and then start up his day again. Now, sure, it meant he grew like a second head and a third arm from hanging around chemicals all day, but it was rewarding enough for him to see his business prosper. Now, what's the deal with this Herbert Dow? He develops uh, a particularly cheap way of producing a chemical none of us use or have heard of called bromine. Now, bromine to, to this day is still used in film developing, in dyes. It's used, it's used to sedate people. There are a variety of, of uses for bromine, but he could sell it really cheaply. So he's selling bromine in the U.S., and, you know, as you can, as you can guess, if you sell bromine in the U.S. For a, after a while, you get a little bored with it. Where else can I sell bromine? So he thinks, how about Europe? I'll sell chemicals in Europe. No problem, right? Except if you try to sell chemicals in Europe, there are a group of, there's a group of German chemical sellers who don't want anybody else selling in Europe. So when Herbert Dow shows up in Europe and says, hey, got cheap bromine for everybody, this cartel of German producers knocks on his door and says, oh, no, you do not. You don't sell anything in Europe. We're the German cartel. We sell the chemicals in Europe. You're not going to sell anything. And he said, well, you know, there's no law against it. I'm going to sell my chemicals here. And so the Germans got really upset. Who does this American upstart think he is? Well, they were selling bromine for 49 cents a pound. Herbert Dow's selling it for 36 cents. So, of course, everybody's buying from him, and nobody's buying from this German cartel. They're going crazy. What are we going to do to this guy? So they think, we're, we'll destroy him. We will sell bromine in the U.S. at a price he can't possibly match, and that'll drive him out of business. So they were going to try predatory pricing. So the German cartel starts selling bromine right in Herbert Dow's backyard in the U.S. for 27 cents a pound. 27 cents a pound. So what's, what's Herbert Dow going to do? He can't possibly match that price. Well, he's clever. He's one of the cleverest businessmen you've ever seen. Because what he does is he has his purchasing agent go buy up tons and tons of this bromine <laughs> at 27 cents a pound in the U.S. And then he goes to Europe and sells it again at, at uh, lower than 49. And so the Germans don't know what's going on, but they're saying, man, there's a huge demand in the U.S. for bromine, much bigger than we thought. How can we possibly keep up with this? So he's still going just fine. He's just buying it up at their price. So as time goes on, they lower it to 15 cents. We'll drive this guy out of business. We'll sell it at 15 cents a pound in the U.S. So he just keeps buying it up at their price and selling it in Europe. And the thing is that they're making losses. When they're selling bromine at 15 cents a pound, these Germans, they're making losses. They want to make up those losses selling at 49 cents a pound in Europe, but he won't let them. He keeps buying it up and selling it cheaply in Europe. So finally they reduce it to 10 and a half cents a pound. I mean, this is going to kill them. And finally, they, finally, 1908, he gets another knock on his door. Not nearly as brusque as that first knock. And so finally, so they finally they, uh, they say to him, well, how about this? How about we sell bromine in Germany? You sell in the United States, but the rest of Europe is open to free competition. What do you say to that? And he said, okay. And so by just sticking to his guns, he, uh, Herbert uh, Dow totally defeated and, uh, this uh, predatory pricing attempt and became quite wealthy in the process, did, did very well, and, uh, and, and established, in effect, a free market in, uh, in chemicals for the future. So I think that's kind of an interesting story, but where's Herbert Dow in the curriculum? You know, why is he not mentioned? He's a great man, Herbert Dow. We should be proud of him as, uh, as Americans. All right, let me just pause here for a second. I mean, I get so worked up when I'm talking about bromine. It's unbelievable. Oh, gosh, okay.